Good evening. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Thanks for coming out today. Uh, Keith is coming in with Pete right now. And uh, if you've not heard, uh, Keith's mom, Sister Parker, passed away last night. And the family will be leaving in the morning to go to uh, Alabama for the funeral service. And so we want to remember Keith and his brother and all their family. And our condolences, Keith, you know, go, go out to you and your whole family. And uh, uh, mothers are a special gift. They're a special gift. And I know he and his brother will be honoring their mother well as, um, as she moves to the next phase of her eternal life. And uh, that's what we celebrate. And so please keep them in your prayers. Uh, grab a hymn book number 524. 524. Rent's going to lead us in our singing. Steve uh, Barber's going to come lead us in prayer. And then we're going to jump into our last lesson. Uh, and so uh, this is the last one in our unchristian series, and I hope it'll be one that'll bless you. And so, Brent, come lead us. All right, number 524. We'll do all three verses. Our Heavenly Father understands. Les said he hadn't heard this one before, so hopefully I'm not doing a solo up here. And also, I need the prayers of those who love me. I need the prayers of those who dare. I need the help of every Christian to take a message everywhere. He pray with me. Heavenly Father, we are blessed to be here this evening to have a midweek worship with you. Dear Heavenly Father, this evening we are with a, our thoughts and prayers are with the Parker family and the loss of Miss Parker and we believe that uh, she is safely in your arms tonight. We ask that you be with the family in the next several days and weeks to come. Dear Heavenly Father, as we wrap up this series of unchristian, we ask that you 
remind us of the things that Les has been teaching us that we can learn how to approach those that are unchristian and take the examples of Jesus, how he treated the unchristian during his time. Great examples, and yet we fall short of that many times. Be with us, Lord, throughout this service and throughout the rest of the week. Keep us safe. Forgive us when we fail you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Those who look at us as not being worthy of, of being listened to, how, how do we do that? How do, how, do we, how do we address people in a way that they will hear us? Especially the millennials and the Gen Zers, that, that, those younger generations that are, are following a lot of us who are, who are older. You know, the Apostle Paul knew that he had to adapt his message depending on his audience. I don't know if you've ever noticed when you get over in the book of Acts, but when Paul would go to the uh, Jews, he would, he would talk about the Christos. Jesus is the Christos. He is the anointed one. He is the long-awaited Messiah of Israel. But when he went to the Gentiles, the Gentiles had no history of Christos. Uh, they had not anticipated the coming Messiah. That was not a part of their worldview. And so Paul had to adapt, and he would not talk about Christos, he would talk about Kyrios. And Kyrios means Lord. Who is the Lord? Who is the true Lord? Who is the only Lord? Who is the Lord of Lords? And so, depending on his audience, Paul would address them differently. Paul, for instance, if he walked into the synagogue, would quote Scripture. Because the synagogue, the Jews, knew their scripture. But when he went to Mars Hill, he quoted Greek poets. Because he knew that they didn't have a clue who Isaiah was. And so Paul, once again, would adapt his message based on the audience. We need to have the same wisdom that Paul had. Not that we change the gospel at all. We preach the gospel. We preach Jesus and him crucified. But at the same time, we need to be aware of what kind of people we're talking to. And, and so the question tonight is how do Christians build bridges to the millennial and Gen Z generations? We've been looking at those things that in the book Unchristian, several years ago, been about 10 years ago now, uh, basically the question was asked, what is it about Christianity that turns you off? And, and it was addressed to people who were not believers or who were quote unquote unchristian. And, and they said, well, they're too hypocritical. They focus on getting converts or proselytizing. They're anti-homosexual. Today they would say anti-LGBTQ. They're sheltered. They're way too political and they're judgmental. And we've taken each of those and just kind of ask, is, is it true? And if it is true, how do we need to change so that those, those criticisms are not criticisms that turn them off? Now tonight what I want to do is, is ask a very important question. And that is, what is it about Gen Zers and millennials that gives us an open door to share the story of Jesus. Now, one of the things you need to understand is just how big the group is. Uh, this is our various generations. What percentage of the American population uh, are these people? This came out last, uh, well, actually came out this year. Uh, this was a little bit earlier in the year. Uh, the greatest generation is down to 0.2%. I mean, th those are the ones who fought in World War II. Uh, most of the greatest generation is gone. The silent generation is now only down to 5.49%. Uh, the silent generation are those who were basically born from about 19, uh, 1930 all the way up to about 1945, called the silent generation. Uh, my dad, my mom were part of the silent generation, and both of them are now gone. The baby boomers are the next generation. I'm a baby boomer. That goes from 1946 to 1964. I was born in 1959, one of the highest years of the baby boomers. And so the baby boomers have for years been the largest generation and, and one of the most influential. Isn't it amazing that the music that you hear in most restaurants 
is not the music of the 90s or the 2000s or the 210s. They are still listening to the music of the 50s and the 60s. Have y'all ever noticed that? June and I, we have a six-year-old grandson. And so when we ask him, what is your favorite music? By the way, my son and daughter-in-law have bought him a radio, uh, uh, excuse me, a record player. Y'all know record players are coming back? Record players are coming back. Vinyl's coming back. And, and so when I asked my grandson, what are your favorite artists? Who do you like to listen to? And his favorite artist is a guy by the name of Johnny Cash. Yeah, there you go, Pete. He's six years old, but he loves Johnny Cash. Uh, June, we gave him what album? John Denver. Yeah, he wanted John Denver, you know. And, and so here's a six-year-old grandson, and he's listening to the music that his, you know, Gigi and Pops listen to. So there you go. Shows you something of the influence of the baby boomers. You then have Generation X. Goes from 65 to 1980. Then you have the millennials, starting in 1981, going to 1996. Both of our boys, mine and June's boys, are millennials. And, and, and there's a difference between early millennials and later millennials. Uh, the early millennials, and my son is one of them, I mean, all you have to do is say, hey, do you want to go to the movie this week? And he said, I might. And I go, do you want to go to the movie this, 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 this week? Well, I might. Well... I need something beside a might. I either need a yes or I need a no. And he says, can I get back to you on that? I mean, ah! I mean, millennials are hard, especially those older ones, to nail down. They just don't want to give you a solid answer oftentimes. And so you have the millennials. And then starting in 1997, going to about 2012, you have what's called the Gen Z generation. The new generation is called Alpha, going back to the... Greek alphabet. There's an alpha generation. And so each generation kind of gets a name. But how do we reach these two? And by the way, notice now the millennial generation, 21.6%. As of right now, the Gen Zers has passed both uh, the baby boomers and the millennials. They're the, now the largest generation in America. Uh, that's the latest research that just literally came in. And so what can churches do to attract millennials and Gen Zers? And so I had to reach out to some millennials and just ask some questions. Okay, so what, what's Gen Zers looking for? And how can we as Christians reach out to them and speak a language that will cause them to go, okay, what did you just say? What did you just say? Let me show you the biggest challenges. This is to Gen Zers. Uh, the biggest challenge Gen Zers has goes back to Genesis 2 verse 18. Then the Lord said, it's not good that the man should be alone. If you just go into, into, onto your computer, search engine, whatever it may be, whether you Google it or Bing it or whatever you do, just go in and type Gen Z and loneliness. And you will be shocked by what you see. Psychology Today, last August, three things making Gen Z the loneliest generation. I mean, when you begin to talk to Gen Zers, uh, they are experiencing record high levels of loneliness. And, and you've got to ask, what's going on? What is it about Gen Zers that are making them to think? By the way, if y'all want to know what's going on, we're putting a roof on right here. All right? If y'all are over here going, is the Lord knocking and we're not letting him in? No. They're, they're putting on some... Uh, uh, new, new roof up there, so trying to get it in as soon as possible. So apologize for the noise. I want you to look at this stat right here. 73% of Gen Z report they feel alone either sometimes or always. I want, let that sink in for a moment. 73%, three out of every four Gen Zers, say they feel alone either sometime or always all the time, and it's the highest level of any generation that's ever been questioned regarding loneliness. And so you have to ask the question, what in the world is going on with that generation? Well, there are three things, according to psychology today, that's causing this. Now, there are other contributors, but these are three of them. Number one, overstimulation. 
They, they literally are just being hit with information all the time. I mean, I want you to think about it. And by the way, they're not the only ones being hit like that. We are too. Out of curiosity, how many of y'all, the first thing you do is get your phone out and begin to look either at the news or your Wordle or... How many of y'all do Wordle, by the way? Okay, several of you do Wordle. How many of y'all need the song Brent led? Brent, I want you to look around. How many of y'all knew the song? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I told you I didn't know that song. All right. Overstimulation has to do with the fact that everything from your phones to, to your computer screens to your iPads, I mean your tablets, I mean, information you get in your car, and our cars now have computer screens in them. I mean, overstimulation is just, just absolutely driving this generation nuts. Notice what it says. Our distractions are eating up most of our cognitive resources, leaving little or nothing for focusing on others. We'd all like to think we wouldn't turn our back on humanity, yet that is what we do every day when we choose an impersonal email over empathy, TikTok over tactile, a text over touch, or Instagram over in person. I mean, we're living in a world of where, and by the way, if you want to see this, just go to any airport, any restaurant, any mall, anywhere people are sitting around, and here's what they're doing. They're on their phones. And you've seen it. I mean, one of my favorite stories is my oldest son, Rob, and, and, and it's Christmas time. It's Christmas time. We're down at my sister's house. And we go to get a board game because we wanted to play the game Risk. And so we've gone to, to, to Walmart to get the board game. And as we're, as we're riding to Walmart in Corinth, Mississippi, I said, you know, son, one of the things bothering me is that we're disconnecting. All of us are disconnecting from one another. And he said, Dad, you are oversimplifying this. That's not happening. I said, Son, it's happening. It's everywhere. He said, Dad, you, no, it's not. And we argued back and forth. We got the board game. We drove back. We walked into the living room where seven people were sitting there. Anybody want to guess what all seven of them were doing? One of them was playing a video game on the, on the television. Three or four of them were on their phones. A couple of them were on their tablets. Nobody was talking to each other. And I just stood there and I looked at him and I said, I rest my case. And that's my family. Okay? And so this overstimulation uh, from all the different devices we have is literally shutting us off from one another. It gets worse. Psalmist said, be still and know that I'm God. Sometimes we've got to pull away from this stuff. One of the things I appreciate about Bible camp this week is the kids that went, go up to Whispering Pines, they can't have their cell phones with them. You know, you got to disconnect. Otherwise, you won't be able to hear God. Number two, social media. The very thing I'm talking about. Now, the problem with social media is that you think social media is connecting you with people. But that's the problem. It really isn't. When it comes to social media, studies show that very heavy social media users. How many people do you know that spend... Hours and hours and hours looking at Facebook or watching YouTube videos. I have people who send me stuff all the time, and I'm sitting there going, do you really think I have time to watch these 30-minute videos you keep sending me? And I pray that you're not watching them because 99% of them is garbage. And I'm like, what in the world are you doing? Very heavy social media users are significantly more likely to feel alone, isolated, left out, and without companionship. I mean, it's like, well, I'm saying hi to my friends on Facebook. Yes, but you're not, you're not touching anyone. You're not looking at anyone. He goes on, social media has caused a comparison trap. This is the biggest part. Comparing our lives to someone else's highlight reels leads to questions like, am I good enough, smart enough, wealthy enough, etc.? I mean, look at my new truck. I got a new truck, y'all. Everybody knows I've got a new truck. I don't have a new truck. What's wrong with me? Hey, look at where I'm at vacation, man. Isn't this vacation awesome? I mean, are you going on vacation? Are you on a cruise? Are you up in the mountains? Are you in Gatlinburg? I mean, 
You see, people post pictures, and of course what ends up happening is we see that one image of that one day that happens in the year when they've got something good going on, but we assume that they're doing that every day, and that's not my life. What in the world's going on? Why am I left out? When in reality, we're seeing these little bitty reel, reels, you know, 45 seconds, minute and a half, you know, clips that just happen to be a little part of one little day that they had. And we just think, wow, they're living it up. And then we all, all at once wonder what's going on or what's wrong with me. And then number three is, is the strange one. And this one's going to hit home in ways when, when I, I, I have never thought about this until I was preparing this lesson. And when I came across this, I went, that's true. That's true in scary ways. Dependency shift. What does that mean? Information is no longer centralized in a family member, neighbor, co-worker, or leader. Information is decentralized, empowering humanity to seek knowledge or help individually. Now you go, what in the world does that mean? Let me explain what it means. How many of y'all this week went into a bank and talked to a bank teller? Anybody this week? One, two, Keith, I knew you would. All right, okay, we got three or four here that did that. How many of y'all went to a checker at the grocery store and let them check you out instead of self-checking? Okay, a few did. Uh, how many of you, the last time you needed something fixed, simply hopped on your computer, pulled up the YouTube video, and fixed it yourself? Yeah, I mean... Uh, I had something I needed fixed, and you think I called a plumber? No, I didn't call a plumber. I can do it on YouTube. I had something else I needed to do, and I, I pulled it up on YouTube. By the way, with YouTube, you can fix anything. I mean, it's unbelievable. And what it has done, it has removed us. Y'all, I don't go to a banker anymore. By the way, how many of y'all deposit checks by just taking a picture of them? Okay, a handful of you. Let me tell you, if we went over to the young marriage, guess how many of them do? It'd be all of them. Right, John? I mean, they're not going to go to the bank. Why don't I want to go to the bank? I just take a picture, it's deposited, and it's done. I mean, I, by the way, have you noticed that, that drive through banks don't exist anymore? By the way, how many of y'all pump your own gas? <laughs> yeah, we all do that, right? Y'all remember gas stations? When people would pump your own gas and clean your windshield and put air in your tires, boy, those days are long gone, aren't they? I mean, everything today is you. We don't need other people. Now, here's what's tragic about that. We used to know the names of the tellers at the bank. We used to know the name of the butcher, right, Donald? The butcher was our friend. We, we used to know the name of the lady or the guy who checked us out at the grocery store. We used to know the name of our druggist. We used to, I mean, did this, right? You knew the name of all the patients, that, you know, the, the customers that came in. We live in a world today where guess how many people are getting their, their medicine now through the mail? You don't even have to go to a drugstore anymore. And what's happening? One by one, we're cutting off all of our relationships. I mean, all of them. I mean, do you know that you can now go over here to Sam's and you just take your app and you just punch everything that you bought into your app, you hit pay, and you don't even have to check yourself out? You do it with your phone? And by the way, what did COVID teach us? COVID taught us that all you got to do is pull up outside of Kroger, call inside and say, can you come and load it in my car? You don't even have to go in the store. And by the way, how many of y'all, how many of y'all use something called Amazon? Right? I mean, listen, I used to have people knock on my door to come visit me. Now they knock on my door to say, hey, your stuff's out here. Right? I mean, I, I, I don't know how many times I've gotten in my car, called June as I'm back in that going, Amazon delivery on the front porch. I mean, we buy everything through Amazon. And you go, why do you do that? Because it's easy, right? You just punch a button, it shows up the next day, sometimes same day delivery. And what does it do? It removes from our lives inner 
personal relationships. And it's happening all the time. As our dependency shifts more and more to technology, automation, artificial intelligence, without a counterbalance, our loneliness will grow. And it is. And the church needs to be a part of the counterbalance. We have got to figure out how do we help people connect with people. We, we, and, and folks, listen. This is moving so fast. Doing church the way we've always done church simply will not work. We have got to be intentional. Now let me show, show you another one. And boy, this is even more disturbing. By the way, let, let me come back to Jesus before I get to the second one. Let me, let me ask you a question. Uh, who was Jesus' best friend? You? That's right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> who was Jesus' best friend? John. Yeah, John's the disciple Jesus loved, John 13, 23. Jesus had a best friend. Let me ask you a second question. Who was Jesus' three best friends? Peter, James, and John. Yeah, you find Peter, James, and John going into the house of Jairus. You find Peter, James, and John going on the Mount of Transfiguration. You find Peter, James, and John going with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter, James, and John are the three closest friends to Jesus. By the way, what was, uh, who was in Jesus' small group? Jesus called them one by one. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Philip, and Bartholomew, Doubting, Thomas, and Matthew. Right? It's the twelve. Jesus had groups of guys, and by the way, there were also women like Mary Magdalene. He had all these people that surrounded him that he interacted with on a regular basis. And if we're going to be healthy, we've got to follow the example of Jesus. And by the way, discipleship begins with this very concept of us learning how to build these small groups that, that we can relate to, that in the process we bring them to Jesus. And by the way, Acts 2.42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Look at the second thing, and to fellowship. Fellowship is absolutely essential and more essential for these two generations that are, 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 are coming up. I mean, the, the millennials and the Gen Zers desperately need fellowship, whether they realize it or not. And then, then our next topic. I want you to notice what the text says. Then the Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. How do you deal with loneliness? God said, let me show you how to deal with loneliness. Because it's not good to be alone. It's not good to be alone. Whenever somebody says to me, I don't like people. I'd rather be alone. Something's wrong. Because God himself said it's not good to be alone. And so what's God's remedy for loneliness? Marriage. Marriage is God's cure for loneliness. But guess what's happened to marriage among millennials and Gen Zers? Let's look at the stats. 56% of millennials today are not married. Pew Research, March 7th, 2023. Excuse me, 2022. Y'all let that number sink in. 56, that means only 44% of millennials. People born from basically 1980 to 1994 are married. Over half of them are not. Now you say, well, they're divorced. No, they're not divorced. They are not married. Now here's one of the things that is fascinating. You know the divorce rate among the ones that are married? What, by the way, what's the divorce rate among baby boomers? Somebody give me a good guesstimate. Anybody? So, so, somewhere between 40 and 50%. 40 and 50%. Among millennials is 25%. Millennials grew up in broken homes, many of them did. And because of that, you've got two results. Many of them are choosing not to marry. And the ones that do marry say, we're going to stay married. And the divorce rate has dropped. And, and by the way, Gen Zers are even more serious about it. And so you see this phenomenon of people not marrying. By the way, I want you to look at average age of a first marriage. This is from the United States Census. Uh, 1970s, when June and I got married, the average age of men was 23 and women were 21. I was 20, June was 19. Okay? Uh, I tell people, we were from Mississippi. You think you could get married young in Mississippi. But when we came along, 
you had to be 21 to get married. Otherwise, your parents had to sign. My mom and dad, June's mom and dad, had to sign for us to get married. And I called Mark Durham one day to see if I could sue them for doing that. For being irresponsible. Doc, they were irresponsible. They knew better than to sign and let us get married. You're like, why did they sign and let you get married? They wanted us out of their houses. Like, go on to your own. I mean, you worry about your life. We won't have to. And, and, and listen, June and I, yes, we thought we were the smartest 20 and 19-year-olds there was. I mean, we, you know, I said, Daddy... I don't have much money. He said, just live off of love. <laughs> Y'all heard that, hadn't you? By the way, what do you do when you have no money and you need to buy Christmas presents? Love don't buy a lot, do they? I mean, you got to get, get creative. Look today. By the way, notice the downturn. Gen Zers are starting to get married more often, but it got to over, uh, almost up to 31 and 29 for the first marriage. This is the first marriage. And what that means is the number of elementary school children is declining because they're not having kids. You see, June and I, I mean, we, we had a kid by the time we, you know, I was 24 and uh, she was 23. You know, we've got a son. Now they're not getting married until their early 30s. And by the way, that's average. For every person that gets married today who's 20, somebody's waiting until they're 40 to get married for the first time. And so you see, marriage is just really struggling right now in America because of what's going on among millennials and Gen Zers. And so why are millennials waiting so long to get married? Number one is the pull for of independence. I mean, just, just stay independent. There is a mindset among millennials that you don't have to be with someone in order to be happy. Now, guess what? God said different. And there's your problem. I, I, don't, I don't have to have someone in my life to be happy. And, and God said it's not good for the man to be alone. And so you've got a different concept going on. And by the way, is one reason that the Gen Zers are called the loneliest generation there is. I mean, even though they're thinking this is going to work, it actually doesn't. It goes the other direction. Number two, the choice paradox. I don't know how many people I have performed weddings for in the last 20 years that when I said, where did y'all meet, what is their answer? Online. I'm like, you're kidding me. I got this one couple, both of them went to Lipscomb. Both of them were friends at Lipscomb. Both hung around together at Lipscomb. Only thing is, they never dated each other at Lipscomb. They both graduated Lipscomb. They weren't married. By the way, when I was at Freed Hardeman, Keith, do you remember what happened to unmarried people when they were seniors at Freed Hardeman? They got what's called the senior hots, which means you've got about nine months to get married or you're in trouble. And they got serious about getting married. June and I got married after, at the end of my sophomore year and her freshman year. Keith, you and Sandra at the end of what year for you? So, you see, Keith had good sense like I did. Get married at the end of your sophomore year, you know. Well, the choice paradox now is just wait. And by the way, this friend, this couple came to me to get married, and I said, uh, how long y'all known each other? Oh, we've known each other since college. We went to Lipscomb together. I said, oh, so you started dating in Lipscomb. They said, oh, no. I said, you didn't start dating at Lipscomb? I said, oh, no. We hung around with each other, ran, ran around in the cra same crowd. We did stuff together, but we never dated. I said, then how in the world do you get together? Match.com. I went in, filled out my stuff. She went in, filled in her stuff. I got a match. I'm like, wonder who this is. And there pops up the girl he had gone to school with for four years but never thought of asking out for a date. And guess what? They got married. I'm like, it took a computer program to figure that out? Come on, guys. And yet that's the case. I see it all the time. And, and, and by the way, the thought is a very simple thought. The choice paradox goes to this. Simply put, because young people have so many avenues and options when it comes to finding a mate, they're taking their sweet time to explore those options rather than rush to the altar. You know what? I can just go on any number of internet programs, put in my information, and find all kinds of people that I can go out with at least once. 
The choice paradox and the anxiety that stems from it may contribute to the fact that more millennials cohabit prior to marriage than past generations. I have worked with many couples. This, again, is coming from uh, a particular article. Uh, this is from uh, oh, it's a, it's a marriage site. I, I'll, I'll pull it up here in just a moment. But uh, this, this particular counselor says, I've worked with many couples who have stated that they are choosing to live together to make sure it's what they both want. In other words, the way millennials operate is they find someone that they might be interested. Maybe, maybe I'm interested in marrying you. And so what do they do? They just move in together. They live as husband and wife without a marriage license. Without, without God's blessing. To see whether or not they get along with one another. You know, it's kind of like buying a car that has a 90-day bring-back guarantee. You know, I drove that car, and after 90 days, I didn't like it. I traded it back in. I don't know about you, but I don't want to buy somebody's car that's been tried out for 90 days. Yeah, it's not new at all. I mean, why, why would I want to do that? And yet you have situations where people simply say, let's just see how this goes. And by the way, the problem with that is that if you approach marriage with the idea of, I want to see if we're going to be happy. Y'all remember what it was like to get married? I mean, for the first time you're living with someone who's different from you, who doesn't eat what you eat, who doesn't, doesn't do the laundry the way you do the laundry, who doesn't keep the house the way you keep the house, who doesn't spend money the way you spend money, I mean, it took June forever to get me straightened out. I mean, she's like, you're doing all this stuff wrong. And I was. And I was like, wow. And by the way, if, if your first disagreement, you decide, this is not working out. I made a mistake. Is that really the way you build a marriage? Or do you build a marriage by making a commitment that says, you know what, this is for better or for worse. By the way, those old marriage vows that we used to use, they were pretty good marriage vows. For richer, for poorer, for better, for worse, in sickness and health, till death do us part. Probably had the idea right. And then the third one, why are millennials waiting so long? New definition of marriage. This is the one that bothers me most. It's not about finding someone decent to start a family with. It's about finding the perfect person whom you truly, deeply love. Just out of curiosity, how many of you were the perfect person? I wasn't. If I had to be the perfect person for June to love me, I would have been in trouble. Now, I got the perfect one, but I'm special, right? I mean, most of us, what happens is we find people who are flawed just like we're flawed. By the way, anybody remember how long Rebecca had known uh, uh, Isaac before they got married? I mean, I mean, Abraham's servant has, had went off and got Rebecca. And she came in on a camel and jumped off when she looked and she said, who's that? And she said, that's your new husband. Let's go and meet him. They'd never met before. I mean, I mean, how in the world do you get married to someone you absolutely don't know? And yet they had a great marriage. Uh, this concept of finding the perfect person. Uh, I, I, I remember I had a, had a young lady who went to Freed Hardman. And every time she'd come back from Freed, I said, you found a boyfriend yet? Nope. Found a boyfriend yet? Nope. Every year. Found a boyfriend yet? No. I said, what is wrong? She said, they're all immature. I said, of course there are. They're guys. There's no such thing as a mature 18, 19, 20, and 21-year-old guy. They don't exist. I mean, they don't. We, we all know that because we used to be that way. I said, you get one that's just kind of maturing and you bring him along, you know. But I kept thinking, man, you're looking for that perfect one. You may not ever find them. So what can churches do? Uh, we need to get serious. Let me, let me go back to this one. We need to get serious about teaching about marriage and strengthening marriage and modeling marriage. I love grace marriage, what we've got going on right now. John Micah got us involved in that. It's fantastic. Uh, June and I were going to go and simply uh, visit and see what it was like after the first four hours, I told June, sign us up. We're going to do this. 
And so Jen and I have been going and sitting at a table with other couples, young couples mostly. What, what is so bad about me and June is we're sitting at a table with couples, and, and we've been married 44 years, and most of the people at the table are not even 44 years old yet. I mean, we sat there, and I go, how long y'all been married? Eight years. And I look at June, and I'm like, wow, okay. This is, you know, 44 years, and of course somebody's like, so you haven't figured it out, out of four, after 44 years? Oh, not all of it. And, and if I did, I probably need to go back and be reminded of some of it. And then finally, the, uh, the next area, and I'm running out of time, then God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. One of the biggest problems facing today's generation is this one. Three-fourths of millennials are desperately singing, uh, seeking meaning and purpose in life, making them most likely among American adults to question their very reason for living. This is from the Barner Research, November 9, uh, 2021. One of the biggest problems facing both millennials and Gen Zers is they don't feel like life has a purpose. The research found that fewer than one in five millennials contend that life is sacred, while half of millennials argue that life is what you make it. There is no absolute value associated with human life. In other words, what's the purpose of existing? There is none. Fifty percent believe that. We, we have a generation coming up of both millennials and Gen Zers who don't have a reason to live. And brothers and sisters, that's scary. Percentage of high school girls who considered or attempted suicide from 2019 to 2021. Y'all look in 2021, that's in the red, 30% of all high school girls seriously considered suicide. Y'all let that sink in. No reason for living. Confused. Don't know who they are. Don't know where they fit in. Don't know what their purpose in life is. So what, what do you do? Best thing you do is just end it. I mean, look at the numbers. I mean, attempted suicide, 13% in, in 2021. Now, COVID was going on. Okay, I get that. But, but 13% attempted suicide among teenage girls in America. It just shows you how, how difficult so many of our young people are having. Ecclesiastes 3.11, he's made everything beautiful in its time. He's also put a, a eternity in man's heart. The book of Ecclesiastes is this incredible book about purpose. And Solomon is sitting there and he's trying everything in the world. Maybe purpose is all about getting wealthy. And he got wealthy, more wealthy than any man that ever lived. But that didn't bring him happiness. Well, maybe, maybe purpose is about marrying as many women as you can. And so he married so many women. I mean, 700 wives, 300 concubines. I mean, let's just have a 1,000 of them. And see if that will bring you happiness. But it didn't bring you happiness. Education. Let's be the smartest man that ever lived. He studied science. He studied plant life. He, he, he built incredible buildings. I mean, here was a man who thought, surely something will be, bring me meaning in life. And when he finally ended, ended, he said, now all has been heard. Let me conclude all of this. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. That's the duty of man. Have a relationship with the one who put eternity in your heart. David French, who lives in Franklin, Tennessee, he, he's a conservative uh, writer. But he said, people say that women won't love while men won't respect. He just wrote in New York Times, this is February of this year. He wrote in New York Times, let people respect you because you have integrity. You are kind, value yourself and others, and make a positive difference in the world. Virtuous purpose, look at the language there. Virtuous purpose is worth more than any other person's conditional and unreliable respect. It is rooted in service and sacrifice, not entitlement. And those qualities bring a degree of meaning and joy far more important than the gifts that others can ever offer. What we do for others is infinitely more rewarding than what we ask them to do for us. And I think he's exactly right. Serve others. Why? He's a believer in God, believer in Jesus Christ, because we're created in the image of God. So what can churches do? Realize that we're ambassadors of Christ, and God's making his appeal through us. We have a purpose that's the greatest purpose of anything in this world, because we are ambassadors of Jesus Christ, imploring people on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God.
And then finally, and our time is up, millennials and Gen Zers want to experience God. They want a sense of the holy. They want a sense of the mystery. Uh, Churches of Christ have traditionally been very rational. And, and I appreciate that part of our fellowship. But in our, in, our, in our drive to be rational, we have pulled away from the emotional. Uh, I remember as a kid watching preachers cry. I remember watching men holding our meetings, getting down on our knees and, 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 and praying to God. Uh, I mean, I, I, I remember people presenting a God who is holy and almighty and and, and we've moved away from so much of the emotional aspect. And, and I think a lot of it's out of fear and a lot of it's out of, well, if we go too far em- emotionally, we'll forget about, you know, the rational side of Christianity. And, and that's always a danger. But brothers and sisters, we have got to realize that, that people have got to connect with God both up here and they've got to connect with God right here. Uh, that was one of the things that, that created so much conflict during the clapping wars. Y'all remember the clapping wars in the church? And that was over whether or not you could, you could clap after a baptism. You know, I grew up, and, and the way we celebrated baptism when I grew up was powerful. I mean, we would sing this song. Oh, happy day. Y'all remember that song? I mean, by the time we got through with the song, I'd forgotten what I'd done when I was baptized. And I was like, was I baptized? You know. I mean, y'all, listen, I appreciate the song. But let's just face it, it wasn't much of a celebration. I remember seeing a guy who came to the Lord who had been a drug addict when he was a young man. And when he was baptized in, in the baptistry, he'd come out, up out of the baptistry and he literally was shouting and, and just jumping up. And when he came out of the baptistry after changing in his clothes, she came, he came running, jumping up in the air, shouting and just praising God. And I looked at it and I said, I'm pretty sure that's the way the eunuch went home after he was baptized by Philip. He went home rejoicing. May I remind you that when the prodigal came home, that what made the older brother realize that something was bad wrong is that he heard music, and he heard dancing, and he smelled the cooking of the fatted calf. What had the father done? He said, it's time to celebrate. And if you've ever gone to Israel and you've ever watched Jewish people dance as they praise God, you will realize that the fears we have in emotions, if we just went back and saw what ancient Israel did, we would probably say, now that is the way to worship God. Now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we bring dancing in here in the auditorium. I'm just saying go to Israel and watch men or, or watch Jewish people. It's, it's, not, it's not, nothing sexual to it at all. It is about joy and celebration. And you visualize what that father did when his son came home. And, and by the way, if you also go to Nigeria, there's a brother there named Moses Akpanudu that I've known for over 30 years. And, and let me tell you, uh, he runs a Christian university there, only Christian university in Nigeria. And yet when they celebrate... They, they, they celebrate not Americanized, but Nigerian way. And boy, the worship is something amazing. The celebration is something amazing to watch. All right, our time is up. Let's pray. Father, thank you. We want to be your people. We want to be your ambassadors. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding. Help us, Father, always to weigh what we do in a way that will draw people to you and never drive them away. Help us, Father, truly to be those who say, be reconciled to God because of Jesus Christ. 